Um, first of all, I'm Marcia. Um, I am a Davis Dyslexia Correction Facilitator. My office is located in Somerset County, so I'm in the Laurel Highlands, which is why my business name is Laurel Highlands Dyslexia Correction Center. Um, I'm additionally, I am also trained as a Davis um, training supervisor. So in addition to providing Davis Dyslexia Correction programs, I also provide trainings um, through Davis Dyslexia Association to people interested in becoming facilitators. So I get asked the question all the time, how did I get involved with Davis? So my story started more than 25 years ago and my own daughter was in second grade and was struggling and I was looking for answers and believe it or not, that was before the time of internet. So I did the next best thing. And I went to a bookstore in Greensburg and the book, The Gift of Dyslexia is the book that actually came into my hands. All right. Um, so I read the book. Um, I scheduled my daughter to do a program. It was so life changing for her that I became more interested. And I went through the training myself to become a licensed facilitator. So the gift of dyslexia is written by a man named Ronald Davis. He is still alive. Um, he's in his eighties, he's living in the San Francisco area of California. And everything you're going to hear me talk about is based on his theory and the core concepts of his approach for dyslexia. So um, about the age of 38, which was over 40 years ago, he made a discovery about his own dyslexia that enabled him to read a book in just a very short period of time. And prior to that time, he was a virtual non-reader. He was pretty, he was very brilliant. He was um, successful in business, but he was unable to read or write. But he made a discovery about himself that led him to be able to read a book by himself. So he went into research and he formed a, the Davis Dyslexia Correction Program based on his personal life experiences, as opposed to like looking at the brain science, he was basing it on his own personal experiences. So many people, it's really difficult. What I'm finding in my practice for over, over 20 years, very few people come to me with a label that says they have dyslexia. And a lot of times it's because of the definitions that are being used by the testers. So if you look in a dictionary, you'll hear things like an impairment of the ability to read, um, or it could be an inability to read properly, or um, the definitions that are used often have to do with the structure of the brain as opposed to the function of the brain. So a lot of the testers are using the idea that dyslexia is caused by brain damage. Whereas in the Davis theory, we're talking about a brain that is just fine, but it's the function of that brain that causes the problem. So that's where I'm going to go, um, you know, a little bit in the introduction to the idea of the Davis theories. So common characteristics that are shared by all dyslexics, um, they're picture thinkers. They form pictures. Um, they think with mental images as opposed to like having an eternal dialogue. Um, they're able to register their mental images as though it were, real and actual. So they have a lower than normal. They also have a lower than normal threshold for confusion. So if you have ever put together a child's toy on Christmas after midnight, you'd already know what the lower than normal threshold for confusion is. It's the point where progress stops and you can't continue. Okay. So there are two types of thinking. There's verbal thinking and there's nonverbal thinking. Verbal thinking is thinking with the sounds of words. So verbal thinking is linear in time. It follows the structure of language. So when you're thinking in verbal thoughts, you compose mental sentences one word at a time and it occurs about the same speed as your speech. It's like carrying on an internal conversation with yourself. Um, when you're using verbal thought, you're thinking with the sounds of the language. A lot of school curriculums are designed for the verbal thinkers, sounds of the language, phonics, things like that, okay? Um, our dyslexics are actually nonverbal thinkers, meaning they think with pictures of the concepts or ideas. Nonverbal thought is evolutionary. The picture grows as you add more concepts. 
So it's when we form mental pictures of concepts and ideas, the pictures aren't merely visual. They're more like three-dimensional multi-sensory movies and they change and evolve as a sentence is read. The process for nonverbal thinking is about 400 to 2000 times faster um, than verbal thought, which is about 32 um, pictures per second. So again, our dyslexic learners are the nonverbal meaning that they think in pictures. They're not nonverbal like someone with autism who can't speak, but they, when they are reading and thinking, they're thinking in pictures as opposed to um, having an internal conversation. Another term that you hear in the um, Davis theories and core concepts is the idea of disorientation. So disorientation is a natural function of a normal brain. It happens to all of us at one time or another. When a person gets disoriented, the perceptions become altered. So think of a time for yourselves. Have you ever heard a sound and thought it was something else than what it really was in reality? That's just an alter, it's when your perceptions become altered. Um, if you're like, here, if I'm sound asleep and the heat starts running and the pipes start knocking, I'm sound asleep, I'm disoriented into my sleep and it appears that someone's knocking on the door. And then I wake up and I reorient and I think, oh yeah, I, I get it now. It's just the pipes knocking. Or it could be whenever you are um, sitting in your car and you're stopped at a red light and the car next to you starts moving and all of a sudden you think, oh my goodness, I feel like I'm moving. You're not really moving, but your mind is telling you that you're moving, right? Um, or it could be whenever you see something like um, I always share the story. I like to ride my bike and I like to go to the bike trails. What I don't like are snakes. And sometimes when I'm riding my bike and I see something straight and black on the trail ahead of me, immediately my brain says snake. But in reality, it's usually a stick. OK, the other sense that can be affected is your sense of time. So have you ever been really bored and time seems to be um, holding still? or when you're on vacation and doing something really fun and time is flying. So again, when a person in real life, we all get disoriented um, when it happens, um, our brain's receiving conflicting information, but we're perceiving it as though it's real. Okay. Um, so using that idea of disorientation, dyslexic people use disorientation in their thought and recognition process. So when they're confused, they immediately experience a disorientation and begin to perceive the thought as reality. Um, the process is so rapid that they don't even realize it's happening. Um, it can occur without an apparent cause and it may last from a split second to hours on end. So our dyslexic individuals become disoriented when they're reading or writing and then their perception becomes altered. This is the same mechanism that dyslexics have found useful for recognizing real life objects in the environment before they learn how to read. So um, again, our people with dyslexia can see, hear, feel, and sense what they imagine as though it were real, were real, and they can view and interpret the world in creative and innovative ways. So if I had this up on a slide, um, dyslexics are visual, multi-dimensional thinkers who are intuitive, highly creative and excel at hands-on learning. They're generally of above average intelligence, but they exhibit a gap between potential and their actual achievement. So again, super, super smart, but their test scores don't show it. All right. Lists of famous dyslexics come out everywhere, but there are many, many famous dyslexics. Um, again, you have, um, Alexander Graham Bell, Albert Einstein, Whoopi Goldberg, Bruce Jenner, um, Jay Leno, Nelson Rockefeller, um, Woodrow Wilson, Henry Ford, Albert Einstein, Walt Disney, Leonardo da Vinci, Winston Churchill. So it's easy to see, um, you know, given this background, that the reason these people, um, these great inventors, these great writers, they have the per perceptual ability um, to view things multidimensionally and can figure things out that other people can't. All right.
Another term that we use in the world of Davis is um, the term the mind's eye. So a lot of people consider the mind's eye to be what, um, actually they consider the mind's eye to be the imagination. Um, we think of the mind's eye as what sees pictures in the imagination. It's the point our brain chooses to look from when we're processing in pictures. So if I would ask each of you to imagine an elephant, are y'all able to imagine an elephant? Yeah, so again, you're seeing a mental image of an elephant, but you're not really seeing it with your real eyes, are you? You're seeing it with your mind's eye. So some of you might be viewing an elephant that is pink like Dumbo the elephant. Some of you might be viewing an African elephant. Um, or if you imagine home, so are you all able to imagine home? Yeah, some of you might be imagining the inside of your home, some might be imagining the outside. But again, you're not seeing it with your real eyes, you're using your mind's eye. All right, so dyslexics use their mind's eye. So when the real eyes are seeing an unknown object or symbol, they experience the feeling of confusion. The feeling of confusion triggers the part of the brain that alters perception. And the brain uses the perceptual ability of moving the mind's eye to look at the unknown from every possible dis direction. And they might see up to 2000 views of what it might look like in a blink of an eye. Um, but when they do this, they achieve recognition. So I'm not sure if you're able to see if I hold this up to my camera. Um, again, I have, have a whole bunch of animated slides that I'm not able to use, but can you see what I have here? It's a pen, right? Can you see everybody? Can, can everybody see me? Okay, so it's a pen, right? If I turn it this way, it's still pen, right? Um, even if you see that much of it, just that little bit, can you tell it's still pen, right? So a dyslexic started out as a little kid and they could look at things in the real world and be able to actually see them from all different angles and achieve recognition. Even if they see just a tiny bit, they can still see, say, oh yeah, that's a pen. So then they set it up when they get to school and they look um, at symbols and symbols, the meaning changes. So I'm just gonna write, I don't have a Sharpie at my, right at my fingertips. So I'm gonna just draw on a piece of paper. So everybody see this? There's a letter on there, right? So again, a dyslexic is used to manipulating things and turning them from all different directions to try to figure things out. And so they might do this or this. And so the, the meaning changes whenever you start looking at symbols and words from different directions. All right. Um, So again, if I had my slides up here, I could show you all sorts of different animations and, and um, what happens when you're reading. But just imagine if you are a dyslexic and you are trying to read something and you get to a symbol and you don't know what it is. And so you're used to taking a pen and looking at it from all different directions or a cat or whatever it is. And then you hit the symbols and the letters and you get confused and your mind's eye takes off and you start viewing those from all different directions and they move around and the, the letters may be spread out or move together or the lines are wiggling, do you see how it can be a real puzzle for someone to read? And it becomes, a, a lot of parents will think there must be something wrong with my kid's eyes because my child says the lines are moving or my child says I don't see spaces or the letters jump around. Um, I can remember in my own experience asking my daughter, I said, why don't, first of all, she didn't like to color. And I said, why don't you like to color? And she said, I don't like to color because the lines never hold still. So can you imagine just doing a child skill and you're trying to color and stay in the lines and the lines are never holding still. When she started school, her writing was pretty, pretty rough looking and it didn't stay on the lines and there were never spaces. And I said, well, why don't you, you know, stay on the lines when you're writing. She said, well, mom, the lines always wiggle. Sometimes they wiggle this way. Sometimes they wiggle this way. Sometimes it's like a fishing net, but they never hold still. So could you imagine trying to read when the lines are moving and the words are moving and there's no spaces between the words, all right? So again, that's the disorientation piece. 
a dyslexic used that disorientation piece when they were little to solve things like they could take a bucket of Lego blocks and dump them out on the table and imagine what they want those blocks to turn into and they could create a beautiful thing without even using a pattern. Um, but that same thought process doesn't work whenever you hit school and you start seeing symbols and words that you can't attach meaning to. All right, so that's the, the basis of the problem. Um, you know, if you could imagine if you were looking at a spinning dish and seeing the swirls in a dish, and then you look at a page of print and the words are just fluttering all over the place, that's instantaneous for us. And then we just blink our eyes and it's gone. But can you imagine trying to learn in those conditions? And then you have really, really well, ed really well intentioned educators who don't understand. And then they say things like, well, just sound it out or just try harder or just if you're not sure, just guess. And then it just really promotes all sorts of um, compulsive solutions that are a detriment to a dyslexic learner. So the same ability, oh, something just came up. Oh. Your slideshow nope. is up. You just gotta tell me what slide you're on. You know what, um, if you could, let me go back just for a couple. Um, I want you to see the animations. If you could go to slide number 11. There you go. And then click it again. I don't know if the animations will. There you go. So do you see with with that picture of the cat? Now click it one more time and it'll go on its side. Oh, OK. So do you see how it's always a cat, even though you're seeing different views? Now, if you would click to the next one, please. Thank you. And then if you click it in, see if you get the animation. Do you see how if you flip it, and then there should be one more. I don't know if it'll play. It'll come out sideways. Just click one more time. Up, oh, it did it. So anyway, if someone is seeing cat from all different directions and they look at it and look at it and look at it, they may end up with something that looks kind of like this. They have, and then especially if it's a spelling test, if they have been told to write a word 10 times or maybe 20 times, and they have all these different, based on where their perception was at the time they wrote it, they might have all these different pictures of what a spelling word is supposed to look like. And then they look up in their mind and they, it's time to write the spelling word. And I say, hmm, I have all these images, which one is the right one? So do you see how that can be a real puzzle? All right, if you would just go to the next one and those are, and just keep clicking, it should, and the animations aren't really coming through. But um, again, oh, perfect, hang on to that one. So the next one, um, Again, if someone wants to just, um, you know, take a stab at reading that. Um, again, reading, it says, while reading, disorientation can cause dyslexics to perceive words on a page strung together with no spaces, making it nearly impossible to decipher words with in, uh, I'm not, something worse. Do you see how it just makes it become very, very impossible? I, I've reached my threshold for confusion. I'm at the point I really don't even wish to continue. <laughs> so imagine, so what you have here is just a flat example of what it might look for dis, like for dyslexic to read when they're disoriented. But imagine then if the lines are wiggling or, you know, the letters might be popping up off the page um, because dyslexics can think with multi dimensions. So imagine trying to read and then having someone with the best of intentions saying, well, if you don't know what the word is, just sound it out or just concentrate or just try harder. All right, so if you would just go to the next slide, please. Again, this one's a little easier to read, but there's a bunch of stuff on here that you could perceive in more than one way. So the first one says, print your name in capital letters in the upper right-hand corner of a piece of paper. Underneath it, draw a circle that is three inches in diameter, and number three in the middle of the page, 
draw a square that measures and see, do you see the six? It could be a six or a nine, depending on which way it goes. So do you see how the meanings can change just based on those things? And then it says, when you have finished, raise your hand. And then I don't know if that last part in the speaking bubble is la or help. Again, it could be based on your point of perception. It could be perceived many different ways. All right. So if you would go to the next one, please. Again, this is the part where I said, if you, when you're a picture thinker, if you see the word elephant, you're seeing the meaning of it. All right. Yeah, so this is kind of where I was. Um, yeah, seeing the picture, seeing the elephant, the word elephant is seeing its meaning. But it's impossible for our picture thinkers to think with words whose meanings cannot be pictured. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. So knowing what an A looks like doesn't let the dyslexic think with the word A or seeing the letters T-H-E for the, again, you can see the letters, but if there's anybody here who can see a picture for either of those words other than the letters themselves, um, it's really hard. Again, think about our dyslexics who can't think with the sounds of the language. They see a word like this and there's just really a blank spot. There's a hole. Okay. Um, and there are more than 200 words in the English language that are like this. And these are words that don't have pictures attached to their meaning. Um, yeah. So if you go to the next one, please. Yeah, so again, there's a picture of all the little words. Um, reading a sentence using nonverbal thought can produce dyslexic symptoms because you can't think with these little words. Um, the problem is compounded each time a picture thinker tries to read a word without a mental image. And when there's too many stacked up all in a row, that's when they get confused enough to get disoriented. And then their perceptions are altered. And then in addition to making a mistake, that's when the lines wiggle or the words all cram together or something. All right. And so the next one, if you would do that one, please. And actually, so what I have here is just a really easy passage um, from the Equal Shanker reading inventory. And I have lines drawn in where, where there are trigger words. So, you know, the first one is Jan blank blank dog blank dog's name blank pat blank 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 fast. Blank, day, pat, blank, blank, Jan, look, blank, 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 dog, blank, blank, eat. And the last one is, um, it's not all showing on my screen, um, blank, 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 home. All right. So if I was doing this with a group of um, teachers and I have done this already, I will say to the teachers, number your, I get, you know, I use teacher language, number your paper one to five, read the story and answer the questions. So um, if you would just um, hit return, it should bring in the questions next. Yeah, so number one, blank, blank, Dan, blank. Anybody want to, yeah, if you want to bring them all up, that's fine. There's five questions. So the first one you can probably guess because you see the word Jan and you see the word dog. So probably number one is dog, just based on the pieces you have there. And then number two is dog's name. So you can probably figure out that Pat's the answer for that one. Number three is blank, 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 dog. And they have something about fast on the quiz side. So maybe something about running fast or something because dogs run. So you can kind of take your knowledge and get an educated guess on that one. Number four is where it gets really dicey. There is not enough information looking at the passage and looking at the question. This is a true story. I did this with a group of teachers many, many, many years ago. And the teacher was my, both of my daughters had her as a music teacher, brilliantly smart, extremely talented with perfect pitch in the whole nine yards. When we got to number four, she answered the question with 100% certainty. And she said, the answer to number four is cat. All right. So I don't know if you can see where my arrow is, but look on the next to last line, blank dog, blank, blank, eat. She actually perceived the word eat as cat. She was disoriented. She saw something that wasn't there, but she registered a mental image of a cat. 
So she was certain that number four was the word cat. All right. Um, it was a very learning experience for everybody in the room because her peers laughed at her. They thought she was being funny. And she was not. She was 100% serious. She came up to me after the presentation and she said, Marcia, if you could have put a rubber stamp on my forehead whenever I was in the fourth grade, it would have said dyslexia. Um, and again, she just really resonated with what she had seen and what we talked about. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. And go ahead and click through the, so there's the story in case you were um, in your mind thinking of what it might be. Here are the, here's the story and then you have the questions that go with it. But even going back to the one with the blanks, it's on the left hand side, it says Jan has a dog. Again, if you were guessing based on those lines that were drawn there in there, you might think, oh, Jan is a dog instead of Jan has a dog. So do you see why these, these little words are really, really important, but they're often ignored or missed. So any of you who are parents or educators that have ever worked with dyslexic students or those that seem to have the dyslexic thinking style, these little words that we call trigger words are the problem because they don't have a picture to go with it. So it might explain why the, the little nine-year-old can read the word Tyrannosaurus, but every time he sees the word if, he says of, or something like that, because he doesn't, he can read the big words because he knows what a Tyrannosaurus is, but he doesn't know what if means. All right, um, if you would go to the next one, please. All right, and you can, yeah, so, what happens in the development for dyslexia is the individuals are taught in a school, so they're square pegs. I mean, in its simplest form, they're a square peg and they're being forced into the round holes that um, are in school because they're picture thinkers and most curriculums and most lessons are taught for the word thinkers. So they come up with all kinds of strategies either to get out of doing something that's painful um, to maybe, um, avoid doing something or to even make it look like they know what they're doing. So in order for it to become a compulsive solution, it has to have worked at least once and then it's the only way they can function. So this happens with the first one singing the alphabet song happens with every single person I work with no matter what the age because they've been they don't know the letters, they don't know the order of the letters and they start singing the song and that becomes the only way they can function. Um, nowadays, we don't have to look things up so much in dictionaries or phone directories, but I, in my early days, I worked with adults and they would say, yeah, when I look up things in the phone directory, if the word had, if their name had 10 letters, I'd have to sing the song at least 10 times to be able to find it in the phone directory. But again, what they know is the song, but they don't really know the alphabet. All right, so go to the next one. Others have been told if they just concentrate, they'll be able to figure it out. And if they do that once and it works, the minute they are uncertain about something, immediately they'll just begin concentrating. And it's almost painful to watch. All right, go to the next one. Um, our dyslexic learners are great at memorizing. So they can spit out information with absolutely no understanding whatsoever because they're really good at memorizing. So they'll memorize stuff just to be able to take a test, but not really to show any kind of learning. All right, next one, unusual body postures and motions. You know, it could be where they might, you know, they have, instead of looking at a book like this, they might turn it really sideways or they might contort their body because again, based on where their perception was while they were trying to read, they may have, um, figured out if they can turn their body a certain way, it might make reading seem a little bit more comfortable. All right. Um, depending, dependence on others, it's a really common thing. You know, Ron Davis himself was that way. He wears glasses and he was an adult who could not read anything. Even his wife did not know that because he functioned so well depending on others. Um, one of his greatest compulsive behaviors was if he was given something to read it, he couldn't read it. He would take his glasses off and put them in his pocket and just say, I forgot my glasses. Can you read that for me? He was so good at remembering that he could remember what it was verbatim, but he, he managed to accomplish quite a bit depending on others. All right. And then 
sounding out every letter of every word. Again, phonics is a great program for those that can understand phonics. Um, sadly, our dyslexics are um, very low in phonics because they don't understand phonics. And so one theory is if we just give them more phonics, eventually they'll learn how to read. But um, in reality, it's going to probably make it worse because they'll they'll sound out letters of every word if they're disoriented. And it can even be their name, like a word that they know, and they'll still try to sound it out because they're disoriented and it just turns on that habit. All right, next one, avoidance. It could be the kids. Um, if, if those of you who are teachers and those of you who might be parents, I'm sure you have seen, you know, as soon as the, they're fine and as soon as the book comes out, they start yawning or they head to the bathroom or something like that. Um, next one is physical or emotional agitation. Not sure why that didn't come all the way. Oh, there it came over. Yeah, physical or emotional agitation. It could be just, again, they get really upset uh, more easily than what you would think they should. All right, next one is extreme shyness or being the class clown. Um, again, when I was doing the presentation with the teacher who said cat, even though the word was eat in the story, a lot of people just thought she was being the class clown. But in reality, she was 100% serious. Um, and of course, the last one is um, guessing. So guessing can be a huge problem. Um, because if it worked once, immediately, and I have worked with individuals that I, I could tell they were guessing, I could tell they were disoriented, and I would maybe ask them a question like, what is your name? And they'd say, I don't know. <laughs> because they were so used to saying, I don't know just to get out of answering a question. All right, go to the next slide, please. All right, so again, you didn't see the slide for the earlier one, but the earlier slide that I gave on the definitions for dyslexia all surrounded um, the structure of the brain, like you can't read because your brain is damaged. Um, you know, all the definitions that I had listed on here were surrounding that idea. The, the definition we're using here with Davis is um, dyslexia can now be defined as a type of disorientation caused by a natural cognitive ability, which can replace normal sensory perceptions with conceptualizations. When this ability is used in response to confusions regarding symbols, it can cause difficulties in reading, writing, speaking, math, coordination, directionality, and or attention span. So again, there's a lot that goes with it that is not reading related. It could be not knowing left from right. It can be the person who's like the bull in the china store or can't go up and down stairs, can't tie their shoes. Um, dyslexia becomes a learning disability when an individual is compelled or forced to assimilate information while confused and adopts compulsive coping patterns. So the, again, um, having the profile doesn't mean you have dyslexia, but whenever you start um, adopting these coping patterns, that's when it becomes disabling. All right, um, if you wanna to go to the next one. So this is a beautiful quote by Ron. Dyslexia is not a complexity. It is a compound of simple factors which can be dealt with step by step. So again, his theory is um, the gift of dyslexia is the gift of mastery. So if you can master something, it becomes part of your identity. And once it becomes part of your identity, you can do it without thinking about it. So think about people who can, how you learned how to maybe ride a bicycle. You didn't learn how to ride a bicycle by taking a true and false test on the parts of the bicycle and a multiple choice about <clears throat> the steps that you follow to ride a bike. You learn how to ride a bike by getting on the bike and having an experience. And if that experience, if what you tried didn't work, you got, your parents cheered for you, they dusted you off and said, try again. And once you learn the skill, it's with you forever. So those of us who don't ride our bikes all winter long, get our bikes out in the spring and we're kind of rusty, but we still know how to do it because that's a skill that's mastered. So with what we're doing here in the Davis approach is we're giving the clients the ability to master the culprits as opposed to giving them strategies um, that, that work on their weakness. We're actually building on the strengths that they come with. All right, and so um, if you eliminate the reason you have the problem, you eliminate the problem. 
So I know we're getting closer on time and I want to allow time if there's any questions, but so we'll go through these last slides really quickly, um, but turning it around. So what I do is the Davis program and it provides tools to overcome problems with reading, spelling, handwriting, math, attention, focus, and those tools enable both children and adults to recognize and control the mental processes that cause distorted perception. Um, once the perceptions are accurate, they can resolve the underlying cause of the problem, which is the confusion with the symbols and build upon their creative and imaginative strengths. So again, this program builds on the strengths as opposed to remediating a weakness. It also gets to the root cause of the problem. And again, if you eliminate the reason for the problem, you eliminate the problem. All right, so go to the next one. So the Davis program is a three-step program. The first part is an informal assessment. Um, it's not a test for dyslexia. It's to determine suitability for the Davis program. Um, and then if, if the person's a good fit and they're willing to move forward um, and they have goals that are addressable in the scope of Davis, then you complete the 30-hour correction program. It's given intensively one-on-one -on -one over five consecutive days. So it is not a quick fix. It is a jump start. Um, I train the support person because there is a home study program that happens after the program. Okay. Um, so go to the next one. You can skip that one. There's, I've already, okay. So there's two parts to every Davis program. There is um, the orientation counseling, which is the tool to correct the perception. So the dyslexic can see the, same thing that the rest of us are seeing. So they look at a D and it's only a D. It's not turning into a P or Q or a B. All right. And then the next one is David's symbol mastery, which is clay, which was part of Ron's um, childhood experiences that corrects the dyslexia. Okay. So go to the next one. Um, go to the next one. We can skip that one for right now and skip that one. All right. So these are just some pictures. They're kind of fuzzy. But the work that we do, you address the symbols. So with every client, no matter what the age, we start with uppercase and lowercase alphabet. Okay, go to the next one. Also for um, words or symbols, to really master something, you have to know what the symbol looks like, which is how it's spelled. And click it again. You have to know what the symbol sounds like, which is how you pronounce it. And then you have to know what it means. So those little words that I talked about as trigger words, our dyslexics already know how to say those words and they know how to spell a lot of them because they're two and three and four letter words. But what is missing for them is the picture meaning. So go to the next slide. Um, go to the next slide. So using a dictionary and using plastiline clay, they formulate a model that shows what a word looks like they know how to pronounce it. And they also know what it means. When they're able to do that, that word is mastered and it will no longer give them a problem when they're reading. So like the people that say of for for and look for like and in for on, those problems will disappear the more of these words that they master. All right, so go to the next one. There's a motto for and. Looks like a ball and a bat and go to the next one. And that one is the, it's hard to see, but the is that one which is here or has been mentioned. So he has a little talking bubble with his figure. All right. And then the home study program, the, there is a home study program. Again, it's not a 30 hour quick fix. You practice with the rubber band balls um, out of the next one. There's reading exercises. And then of course, the last one is the symbol mastery on the trigger words. All right. And then this is what a kit looks like. So a kit is included with every program. Um, so they have everything they need to continue after the program. All right, go to the next one. Okay, this is what I've been talking about. Another quote by Ron. When someone masters something, it becomes a part of that person. It becomes a part of individual's thoughts and creative process. Um, it adds the quality of its essence to all subsequent thought and creativity of the individual. Okay, and next one. Um, in addition to the reading program, there's a math program and a program for ADD, or uh, actually it's ADHD now. And there's a program for the um, ages five to eight, the reading program for young learners. 
and questions. Okay. So, uh, um, Marcia, this is Catherine. Thank you so much for that great information. I have a couple of questions. Um, can you tell us how much it costs to take your to be evaluated and to go through your your process? Absolutely. So, I charge a hundred dollars for the assessment, and again, I'm not giving you a label. I'm just assessing for suitability for the program. And then, if the program is scheduled in person. The full program price, which the assessment comes off of it, is um, the full program price is $3,000. So at the time of the program, you would owe $2,900. I do online programs. I have to charge more for those because it takes longer than 30 hours. And also, um, there's a lot more expenses and time involved for me. So um, okay. did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And then is there at the end of it, is it very individualized or do you almost always get a positive outcome and the students that are coming to you then at the end of your program are proficient are proficient readers yeah so that's a great question so i have an advantage that schools do not have and that is that i only work for people who want work with people who want to be with me so if someone is not motivated i don't i won't work with them because i sign a standard of practice saying that i will only work for with those who want to be there so I also have enough experience that if I see a program is not going in the right direction, we would end it immediately. And then the fee would be based on the amount of time that I have spent. So okay. of course, um, all my clients leave the program. So even if I'm working with a complete non-reader, they will leave the program knowing that they can learn how to read and knowing what they need to do to accomplish that. Okay. And what is the average age when someone discovers or thinks they might have dyslexia is there an average age is it all over the board and who who comes to you is it are they adults are they students are they parents are they teachers you know what my lot in life seems to be nine-year-old adhd boys <laughs> who come for help with reading but usually about third grade is where they like all the coping strategies that they have used in the past by third grade they don't work anymore for those that are relying on memorizing, they can't survive because there's too much, too many layers and they can't survive. Um, so usually about third grade, um, but it seems like it's getting younger now because um, curriculums are harder now and these kiddos are pushed past their threshold earlier in life. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess, guess ages. I work with adults as well. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. I was going to tag on to that. Do you have a specific age group that you do work with? Um, I have multiple cameras going on here, sorry. Um, do you have a certain age group that you do work with? Let's say somebody is not, not diagnosed until 15. Would they still qualify for this program if they passed your assessment? Yes. Yeah, and actually a lot of the people I work with don't ever have the rubber stamp on their forehead that says dyslexia. A lot of the parents have read the book and they're shaking their head yes and saying, yes, this is my child. Um, or they've done research online and they say, yes, my child has 25 of the 37 common characteristics. So they're not, many of them are not diagnosed, but um, I work with all ages. Um, again, it seems just in my practice, I get a lot more in the third, like the age nine group, but I do work anywhere from age eight all the way through um, 80, probably. Okay, so a age eight is your is your youngest. Um, if they wanted to physically participate in the program, where, I apologize, I didn't know, where are you located? I'm in Somerset County. So if you are all familiar with the plane crash on September 11th, that's yep. just less than 10 miles from here. So it's right off the Somerset exit of the turnpike. Okay. Okay. If um, if somebody didn't live in that area, you mentioned virtual or um, is there, can they participate if they don't live in that area? Yes. So there, because I am the Ellie Davis per provider in Pennsylvania, it's been that way ever since I've been licensed. So I cover quite a large area. Many people come to me, the hotels in this area allow my clients to stay here for a discounted price. Um, and since my children are no longer here and I'm an empty nester, I will travel to the location of my clients. Um, they have to cover my expenses. So if there's turnpike tolls or mileage or a hotel, they have to pay for those extra costs. They don't have to pay for my food because I eat no matter where I work. 
but anything that would be extra for me, they would pay for that. Um, for the virtual programs, again, I have to charge more for those just because I usually can't get those finished in 30 hours. So it takes um, more than the typical amount of time. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? And what, and um, Marsha, how, how many people would you say you're working with at a time? Does it vary? Um, you know what? It's a one on one program. So I only schedule one at a time. Um, I'm getting closer to my retirement age. So I'm a little more kind to myself where I only usually schedule it at, the, at most a week on and a week off and then a week on. It's very intensive work and I want to give my clients my best. So when I was younger and I needed to schedule more tightly, I did. But now I'm trying to give myself necessary breaks so I'm always a refreshed facilitator. Gotcha. And, and I think you said that to your knowledge, there's not any insurance funding or any other funding that covers this type of treatment? Right. Not insurance because I'm not a medical practitioner. I can probably count on one hand the number of times a school has paid for it. It's a real gift for that to happen. Um, lots of grandparents help their grandkids and by because grandparents are maybe in a better position to support these things. But yes, you're correct. Gotcha, gotcha. You, I just have one more quick. You mentioned that you're the only um, provider of this program in Pennsylvania and you're near retirement. Are they, are they working on recruiting and training additional um, facilitators? Yes, yes. And so if any of you are interested, talk to me. <laughs> because, um, and actually, the, Ron Davis has retired officially, and there's a new director now, and there's a lot of restructuring happening, and it's there's I don't know all of the plans, but we're trying to make Davis become the first resort as opposed to the last thing that someone tries, which it always is the last thing because it works. But sometimes I get people that have been through multiple interventions before Davis, so we want it to be you know, it's familiar to say like Domino's pizza or Starbucks or things like that. So um, we're looking I have a question. Um, you had said that no school has paid for it, but have you ha had anybody ask a school to pay for it? You know what? I've had about a handful of schools. And I remember one family and she was actually from Corey, Pennsylvania, which I know is kind of in the area. Yeah, area. yeah. Yep. Okay. But I remember her saying that um, she went to the school and she said, my daughter needs this program and I will sell my car because that's the only way I can pay for it. So that school did pay for her program. So it's it's a great treat to have teachers come as support people, um, but it doesn't happen all that often because my daughter is a teacher. The, my daughter who went through the Davis program as a teacher, I get it. She's busy. She's got 20 some kids. She She can't you know, pay particular attention to only one of her students. And she works for a bureaucracy because schools are that way. So if any of our participants um, would like to ask a question, you can either unmute and ask the question or you can put it in the chat box and we would be happy to read it and get your answer. Hi, Tish, it's Jill. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Jill. Hi. I have a question for Martha. Uh, what type of research has done to show the efficacy of this program? Oh, that's a great question. You know what? I don't, if you go to the website, dyslexia.com, that's mm -hmm. the Davis website. And the, there's a tab on there that for the research page. And that's where you can read all the research studies. Okay. And how long has the program been around? Um, a little bit more than 40 years. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And Marsha, I, I think I heard you say that, that there have been a handful of times that schools have approved, approved this program. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And and how long does that process take? Is it very arduous? Does it is it like pulling teeth? Or if you present the information and why you're looking, why you're suggesting it, do they acquiesce and say this sounds great? We're going to cover it. I think it varies based on from school to school. Um, when I have parents ask me about that, I usually say all that you can do is ask and, and then they go from there. Gotcha. Great. Great. Tish, do you see any questions in the chat box? 
Nope, there okay. are no questions at this time. So last call for questions. We're gonna move on to our next presenter. All right, thank you everybody. Um, I, I apologize for the glitches at the beginning, but I hope you were able to gain some information. Marsha, thank you so much for for joining us tonight and sharing all your great information with us. And again, I hope I hope you'll stay on to listen to Jen's presentation. This is a great segue into Achieva Family Trust Charitable Residual Grant Program. So while there is no funding source other than private pay for Marsha's program, there is a grant program that is available through Achieva, which is the organization that Jen and I both work for. And um, she is going to give you an overall overview of how to apply for a grant. And uh, she'll leave some time at the end to uh, answer your questions. So Jen, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks. All right, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen. Um, and then if at any time during the presentation, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, I know you can put them in the chat so you can go ahead and do that. Yeah. All right, can everybody see this? Let's hope. All right, so our program, um, it enhances the lives of individuals. So some families and individuals lack the resources to access their crit critical special needs support and the charitable residual account provides those supplemental supports and services for children and adults with disabilities. Uh, so how it works is that Achieve a Family Trust is corporate trustee for special needs trust accounts. One of those trusts is called a pool trust. So when a member of a pool trust passes away, any of the existing funds that remain in their pool trust account go into and create our charitable residual program. Since 2005, we have been able to provide more than $10 million in goods and services to people with disabilities. So how it works is that each fiscal year, we are presented with a percentage of that account that is given to residual for us to be able to make disbursements through the grant. Um, last year for our 2022-2023 fiscal year, we were provided with $2.1 million. Uh, we spent $1.9 million within that last fiscal year. Uh, we, were, we received over 1,300 applications last year, and we probably actually processed and approved around 800 of those applications. Um, um, Jen, so, I don't mean yeah. to interrupt. You have us on slide number 10. Is that where you want us to be? No, I'm on number two on my end. Okay, let's see if I can change Sorry. that. That's okay. Sorry to interrupt you. I was just like, no, wait. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm hoping, yeah, let's, uh, let's try that. All right, let's try to present from here and work this out again. Okay, what slide am I on now? Do you see? No slide. No slide, okay. Let's just present. Let's share again and present. Perfect, that's slide number one. Can you see it? Yep, slide number one, work it. Okay, slide number two. Slide number three is whenever we are talking about pool trust accounts. And we are on number four right now. Can everyone see that? You're not moving. I'm not moving. Okay. I don't think it's going along with what I'm sharing. All right. Okay. Right again. So it's sharing. Can you see this? Yep. We can okay. see your PowerPoint screen, but it's not in your slideshow. It's just your. It's not right. in your. Mm -hmm. When I'm putting it into slideshow, it's not sharing. Would you guys mind me going through it this way so that you can see it? That'll be great. That'll okay. be perfect. I'll try to open it. Can you see it this way? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, that's good. Everyone can see that? 
Yep. Okay. I'll keep it like this. Sometimes whenever I present, I don't know what happens. It like, <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere. Um, okay. So eligible applicants are individuals with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, these disabilities can include intellectual disabilities, mental health disorders, and physical disabilities. The residual request is based off of the applicant's needs. Um, we consider a wide range of supports and services for the requests. Um, we've done home modifications, vehicle modifications. We do iPads. We have camp and recreational activities, medical equipment that's not covered by insurance. Um, we have done sensory items. We have done professional services such as tutoring. Um, and also we have done um, some furniture for applicants, some bed bug removal. So as long as it goes back to that applicant's disability and in support of that applicant's disability, it could potentially be something for us to consider through the program. Some things to consider when applying is that our whole request process is an online process. Um, so after we go through some of the PowerPoint, I will take you guys to our website so that you can see how to access that application and go through, you know, the frequently asked questions and everything that we have on that web page. Um, but our application process is online. Uh, only completed applications will be considered for review. So if you start an application and you never go back to it, whenever it comes up to these deadlines, it's going to be administratively denied unless there are some other circumstances that's communicated to me that I would then hold that application for the next review quarter. Uh, they are accepted ongoing throughout the calendar year. However, we do have these deadlines for the submissions. And these deadlines are set up because we just get such a high volume of applications that we have to kind of shut it off at some point so that we can clean up those quarters and then move on to the next review process. Uh, the deadlines are January 1st, April 1st, July 1st, and October 1st. So right now we're finishing up our October quarter. Um, we are meeting, I'm actually meeting tomorrow with our residual team to go over a couple applications that needed a little bit more further discussion of situations that are going on with some of our families. Um, and I always just say, you know, by the end of that quarter deadline is typically whenever you will have your answer for the determination. Um, so applications can be submitted as early as July 2nd, process reviewed and considered for that October 1st deadline. Um, I strongly suggest not waiting until those deadlines because um, everyone thinks that we meet at, on October 1st and, and go through, you know, three, 400 applications at a time and then have these answers. Um, so that's why, you know, the earlier that you submit those applications, the more communication that is between the both of us um, to kind of work through the application, go over some, some questions along the way. Um, but whenever it comes in at the very last date, it's really hard to, to keep those lines of communication open. Um, sometimes I just, you know, encourage people to even reach out to me first before you're going into the application process. And we can kind of just decide if it's something that the team will consider. Um, you know, what you're kind of looking at, like what the outcome is for the for the requests. Um, it's always good to just kind of brainstorm those together and just kind of feel that out together before we go into that application process. Um, so applications, some of them do require discussion and those are ones for like higher, you know, the vehicle modifications, home modifications that are just very questionable. Some of them, um, you know, we do have a discussion at the end of each quarter deadline. I meet with that residual team and that's whenever we have those discussions and try to, you know, completely understand the situations of our applicants. Um, applications are eligible for request every two years. However, camp and recreational um, requests are considered on an annual basis. So if somebody is looking into something like a home modification and they apply in 2023, that would lock them out of the residual request for submission until 2025. In the meantime, they could have applied for a camp or recreational activity in 2023, come back in 2024, and then in 2025, apply for something else through the regular residual. Maybe it's an iPad. Um, maybe it is some professional services for driver's training. 
and they can also apply for a camp or recreational activity as well. Um, we do have a separate deadline for camps uh, just because we do get a lot of those and we like to try to make sure that we review them all and get everything processed in time for our applicants to be able to attend camp. That is an annual deadline of May 15th. Okay, some other things to consider when you are applying is that emergency requests are considered, however, they are by a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the application does have to be completed for it to be submitted for review. We kind of just discuss the situation. You can reach out to me and ask me about having it considered as an emergent need. And then what happens with that process is I will take that to my managers and they will be the one to determine the emergency need or not. Um, if they do not determine that is a, it is an emergency, then it simply stays in the request and goes through the proper process. If it is an emergency, then we expedite it. We send it to our residual team outside of the regular review, and then we process it and try to get payment out as quickly as possible. Achieva will complete all of the purchases according to the date of the applicant's approval. Um, so if somebody just got approved in September of 2023, we may still be purchasing and working on approvals from July of 2023. Um, there's just a team of two of us. Um, I process all of the applications and review everything and even do some purchases. And then there is a full-time purchaser. Um, but each application is very unique. It does take time to process everything. So for us to be about a quarter behind of where our cur current quarter reviews are is where we should be. Um, so what we do is we would look at all of those approvals, look at who's up for purchasing. We will reach out to the applicant prior to the purchase uh, to confirm address and make sure shipping information is correct. We complete the purchase and then we will send it and send the information to the family or to the service coordinator or any kind of case manager that's working with the applicant, we would send them all of the shipping information and, and everything that comes along with that purchase. If there is something like a home or vehicle modification, um, or if someone is coming to us for any type of um, you know vehicle, uh, perhaps it's driver's training, we request an updated invoice so that that includes the payable to information, the um, the applicant's name, and the amount of the approval on those invoices. And we will then process a check and that will go directly to the vendor and no money will ever go to the individual or family applying. Upon approval and purchasing, um, if if we are asking for receipts, sometimes someone is in need of some winter clothing or of some summer clothing, we purchase gift cards. So whenever those gift cards are completed and utilized, we ask for the copies of the invoices and of the receipts that payment has been made and then the purchases have been completed. Uh, this helps us to make sure that what we were providing that payment for was being utilized as per the application process. Um, we have a lot of situations that we are, you know, purchasing or assisting with purchasing clothing and some of our applicants are purchasing stuff that was not approved. Um, so that could compromise the remainder of the approval or any further requests through our program. So reimbursements are never considered through our program. Um, if something is already paid for, you cannot come to our program for any assistance with that. Uh, we always put in here about Pennsylvania Assistive Technology Foundation, um, PATF. It is a low interest rate loan, and a lot of our applicants, um, particularly the ones that are applying for a vehicle modification, will come to our program and utilize PATF. Uh, residual can only consider and look at the cost of the modification portion of a vehicle, but we cannot cover the cost of, a, of the vehicle itself. So a lot of people will utilize PATF for the loan, low interest rate loan program, and we will look at the funding towards the modification portion of that vehicle. Um, so some frequently asked questions for residual is who is eligible? 
applicants throughout the state of Pennsylvania that have the disabilities of intellectual, mental health disorders, physical disabilities, autism, cerebral palsy, ALS. If it's ever a question of the person's eligibility, you can always just reach out to me and we can discuss that for, further. Um, is there an age restriction? Yes, the program does have some restrictions with age um, and it's typically whenever the applicant is 65 and over. If the applicant is 65 and on SSI, they will not be considered for funding. Um, obtaining any type of funding through our program will look like income at that point, and it would compromise any of the government benefits that the applicant would be receiving. So it is our practice to just not fund at that age to, to not have those benefits compromised. If the applicant is 65 and over on SSDI or social security benefits, Funding can be considered of up to $500. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, but we do have a lot of applicants that do come to us sometimes. You know, we have an applicant that just needs a sofa. We could purchase a sofa for under $500. Um, sometimes they need an app or an iPad for communication or doctor's appointments. Our iPad package is under $500 and that's something that we can purchase. Um, I have a lot of applicants that come to us from the MS Society and MS Foundation, and they are looking for items like stair lifts or ramps. Um, we could purchase a portable ramp for under $500 for somebody, or sometimes they will request $500 to go towards that stair lift because they may be getting, you know, a thousand dollars from the MS Society. They get 500 from us and they might have to take out a loan for the remainder of those costs. So whenever you're pulling all those resources together, it does make it a reality for a lot of our applicants. What are the supporting documents that are needed? Um, so all requests require several supporting documents. Um, these documents are designed to provide our reviewers with additional information about the applicant and the specific needs. Um, based off of the application and what you are applying for, these documents will vary. There's going to be more things for some requests. There's going to be less for others. Um, a home modification is a whole list of supporting documentation where a camp or rec activity may only have a few. But these are the top three that all the requests except for the iPad package you will need. Um, so the letter of support, it is a letter of support by written by a professional that provides supports and services to the applicant. Uh, these professionals can include service coordinators, supports coordinators, doctors, physical therapists, occupational therapists, um, teachers, counselors. Uh, the letter should be very sufficient details about the applicant, the applicant's needs for the funding, and how this would truly increase the applicant's uh, quality of life. It should be completed on agency letterhead and submitted. Um, going back to the, you know, the application process is online. So this is to be electronically submitted to that application for review. The second thing are bids. Um, these are bids or estimates for the items that are being requested. If somebody is looking at a um, furniture, um, say somebody has been homeless for several years, they finally obtained housing, and now they need furniture to furnish their home. Um, we can look at those bigger items like the, 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 bed, the bedroom set, maybe a sofa, and maybe a kitchen table. So you would go to two separate vendors, um, which would be maybe a Bob's, Levin Furniture, Value City, Ashley's, and you would compile a cart with the items that the applicant is in need of. Make sure that if you're getting it from one vendor, this, the second comparable vendor has the same or comparable items. Um, you don't want one to say a queen size mattress and the other to say a twin because whenever we go to purchase, the applicant might get the twin instead of the queen. So we really have to make sure with these bids that they are accurate, as, as accurate as they possibly can be. Um, furniture needs to be realistic. We can't, you know, furnish a house for $15,000, but we will make sure that those basic needs are met. Um, you know, again, and making sure that those items are going to fit into that person's home. 
Um, they might have a small apartment, but they want a sectional. Some sectionals don't work. Um, we're not looking at the furniture, you know, with the heated seats and the and the cooler and stuff like that right in there. We're looking at to, to support that basic need. So if they want a sectional, that's fine, but we have to make sure that it's going to fit. So there's a lot of things that go into even a simple, simply purchasing and looking at funding for furniture. Um, but what you want to do is collect those items, put them in a cart like you're purchasing and make sure that all tax and shipping of those items are calculated. Um, and then if there's any additional fees onto that, and then we take that amount at the end, and then that is what you're going to put into the application process is what you are requesting for the items. Um, we have also done just, like I said, clothing too. So if you're looking at $1,500 for furniture, but oh, uh, you know, this person might need a new winter coat, some winter boots, you're going to add $500 onto that request so that they could get those, those items purchased and be warm for the winter months coming up. Um, but again, make sure all tax and shipping and any additional fees are reflected in those bids for us to be able to accurately look at those requests and make sure that we are providing as much funding as we can to fulfill the request. Um, iPad packages, we do not need bids for. They are just going to be the letter of support and uh, the joinder agreement, which I'll get into next. But with the iPad packages, it is a 10.2 inch screen. It is a 64 gig iPad, and it does come with an OtterBox and Apple Care. So for somebody that is looking for it to be utilized for some communication purposes or for doctor's visits, it, it's the perfect um, package for our program. All right, the next thing is the joinder agreement. Um, so going back to the beginning of these slides, whenever we talked about pooled trusts. Uh, so as stated, when somebody from a pooled trust passes away, those remaining funds go into and create our charitable residual program. The document known as the joinder agreement is the document that people and beneficiaries are signing to open up a pulled trust with the Chiva or with any um, trust agency. We need it to be able to, to be signed and submitted to our program because we have to join the applicant to that residual pool of funds in some sort of way. And the joinder agreement does that. So this document is to be completed. It's about a 12 page document. It has to be completed, submitted to our online application for review, and then the original document completed in ink with live signatures um, is then mailed to the Achieva Family Trust Office. Uh, it is mailed directly to me, so whenever I obtain it, I mark it down on my sheet that, you know, John Doe submitted the joinder agreement and I keep it until we get that determination. Once that determination is processed and if the applicant is approved, that joinder agreement is then reviewed by our president of the department. She signs off on it, sent back to me, and then I put it into that applicant's file. Um, if it is approved, it is a one-time document. Once it's on file, the joinder agreement does not have to be completed again. We keep it on file and then we move that forward with the applicant anytime they want to reapply. Um, if there are any questions about the joinder agreement, you can give me a call and then we can discuss it a little bit more in detail. Um, please note that the distribution from the residual account is taxable. Therefore, once funds are processed through the program, the applicant or beneficiary will receive a K-1 tax document the spring following the disbursement. So if somebody just got something last month, coming up this spring, they will receive a, a K-1 tax document. Um, you will take that to your tax preparer and they will let you know what to do with it. Um, it is a very small percentage of what the disbursement is, is looking at what that, what that taxable amount will be. Um, so that is there. And based on the need of the request, we talked about this a little bit, is that additional supporting documents may be requested for submission for the review. And since everything is done electronically and through this online application process, we communicate via email notification. So once you start that request, you're gonna start getting emails with 
joinder agreement needs to be submitted, letter of support, support needs submitted, um, residual request needs to be submitted, and they will just keep listing those items and the emails go up probably every three days. Um, I am on the other end of those emails. So if you ever have any questions or you're going through the application process and you keep getting them, you can always reply to them and just ask me questions. And then we can, you know, again, work out whatever questions you have moving forward. Uh, so some other things, how much can I request? We really don't have any limits as to what we can support through the program. Um, we do take into account like the applicants wants versus needs when they are applying. Um, we really wanna make sure that we are supporting a need and not a one. Going back again to you know $15,000 worth of furniture, we want to support those basic needs. We're fine doing a, a you know, a, a, a sofa. We're fine doing, you know, a kitchen table. Um, but some of those other incidental purchases can be purchased somewhere else um, or, or receive funding somewhere else. <clears throat> um, we do consider uh, home and vehicle mods up to an over $10,000. Um, we just had one recently that I think like it was close to 19,000 for a vehicle modification. So there, there are a lot of situations where we have gone over that $10,000 mark. Um, they have to be evaluated as well, that it's never a guarantee that you're going to receive exactly what you are requesting. Uh, you know, that's all based off of how much funding we have available, how many approvals we're moving forward. And we do try to keep track of that internally to make sure that we're in a good space um, with all of our approvals and to make sure that we're processing them appropriately. Uh, does the residual program consider home repairs? And the residual program is not designed for home repairs. Example of these home repairs include, but are not limited to sewer lines, windows, air conditioning units and furnaces, um, that's installation or repair them. We will not consider pools or hot tubs and we will not do fences or roofs. Um, in addition to that, the program will not cover any individual's bills such as rent or utilities and we will not consider tuition or childcare expenses. When will I know if I am approved? Um, again, you know, once we process everything, we typically say up to, you know, 15 to 20 business days. Um, but with the higher increase of applications that we are see seeing, it is taking longer. Um, at the end of those quarter reviews, uh, you know, like I said, at the end of October, I should have all of the determinations completed by October 31st. Um, and then starting November 1st, we start moving forward with the applications under review for the next quarter. Uh, we do like to get everything kind of cleaned up so there's no question as to what quarter this one goes in and there's no confusion with our team whenever they're reviewing. So at the end of October, I will clean everything up. I will get the final determinations out to our applicants and we will move forward with our January quarter reviews. If approved, when will I receive what I requested? Um, again, we try to process everything as quickly as we possibly can. Um, just with two of us, it, it is kind of, kind of difficult. Um, and there's a lot of, that goes into the purchases. Like I said, we want to make sure that everything is correct. Whenever we send it out, we want to make sure that we reach out to all the family members and anyone involved with that, um, process of purchasing to make sure that we are getting the items specifically for that person's need. Um, so it does take some time. So we always ask for your patience and understanding whenever we do it, um, but we do try to fulfill them as quickly as we possibly can. Um, any questions so far before I move on to the um, website? I have a question. Yes. Okay, I, I have two. So you talked a little bit about like the coats and furniture. Does that just go under the identified person that has the disability then? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so we just heard about the Davis program. How would, you know, a parent 
request for something like that to be covered? So that would be a professional service. Um, we would need an invoice for the services that are being requested, um, which would reflect, you know, how many um, sessions that would entail. It would include the cost for those sessions. Um, and then you would need a letter of support from a professional that could be from maybe a teacher or a therapist, um, someone that's working with your child um, <clears throat> to just kind of let us understand the situation, why the, the funding is needed and how that would increase the applicant's quality of life. Um, so you would need those two things and the letter, or I'm sorry, in the joinder agreement submitted to our online application for review. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? Hi, my name's Nicole. It wasn't working for me to put it in the chat. Okay. I was wondering, would dyslexia be considered one of the disabilities that you would consider? Yes. Great. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. I'm going to go ahead and share our website now. And again, if any time you guys lose me or I lose you, just please let me know. Um, so you, so to find this information, you go to the achieva.info slash family dash trust slash charitable dash residual that will take you directly to the charitable residual program website on here you can scroll down that well if you do that with the cursor you can see what it is application frequently asked questions grateful recipient stories and then to the online application <clears throat> as you scroll down we have a short video too that you guys can look at um, kind of just going over everything that we discussed in the PowerPoint presentation, how it works, uh, things to consider when applying. So everything that I went over, I try to keep my presentations consistent with what is on our website um, so that there is no confusion in what we are saying and presenting. So everything that we just talked about of things to consider, all of the frequently asked questions, are all part of that PowerPoint as well. If you keep scrolling down to the bottom here, you can see the frequently asked questions. And if you hit the little down arrows to open it up, you can see more information about that. And just keep scrolling down. You can see some of the grateful recipient stories and then down to apply today. Um, to the left, you will see the link that takes you directly to our joinder agreement. And to the right is the beginning, the application process. So we've recently added a screening tool um, because we do have another um, program that we are part of as well. And I will touch base on that a little bit. A lot of our participants tonight will not be eligible for this program. Um, because it is based off of certain counties within Pennsylvania where residual is more broader um, and we can support, you know, a wider range of, of needs. Um, and, and it just has a little bit more restrictions, but I'll go into that as well. But the screening tool is very helpful to kind of determine which application process to go through. Um, but if you go to this page, you will be able to see all of that information to apply and to start the application process. So I'm gonna switch over and talk a little bit about um, the Cecil and David Rosenthal Memorial Fund through Achieva. Um, now I work in a Achieva Family Trust with Catherine Rehm, um, and then our parent company is Achieva. Um, so Achieva has our Cecil and David Rosenthal Fund. Cecil and David lived and worked through Achieva Supports. Um, and tragically, they were, um, they were part of the Tree of Life synagogue shooting uh, several years ago. Um, the day of remembrance for them is coming up on Friday. 
Um, so what an appropriate time to bring up their memorial fund um, with the residual, or I'm sorry, with the Cecil and David Rosenthal program. Uh, once the, once, you know, everything happened with Tree of Life, Achieva was receiving a, a lot of donations uh, for, for their name um, in remembrance of how Cecil and David lived, uh, how they were part of their community and how they really embraced everything in their world. Um, so with those funds, uh, Achieva didn't really know what to do with them. You know, we were just getting a lot of donations and the family, our, our board of Achieva decided to make a charitable uh, program in remembrance of Cecil and David. Uh, so right now our program is limited to these following counties in Pennsylvania, which include Allegheny, Beaver, Westmoreland, Lawrence, Butler, Washington, Venango, Clarion, Clearfield, Jefferson, Elk, and Cameron. Um, so if an applicant uh, lives in those counties, they have a disability of intellectual or autism, and they are looking for funding for community engagement and involvement, this is the program that they could utilize for those services. Uh, again, it's a little bit more restricted as the residual program. The applicant does have to have an IDD diagnosis or autism. Again, they have to live within those counties that were listed and the supports have to be for somebody that is wanting community involvement and engagement. But we can still look at things like recreational activities. Um, we just did a bus pass for a mother and her child with a disability. Um, we have just done several gym memberships. Uh, so this is a nice alternative. You can apply for both residual and CDR at the same time. Um, you can apply for one or the other. You can come back to, to the Cecil and David Rosenthal Fund annually right now. The program is not as big as our residual program. We don't have as much funding in this program, but we are trying to, you know, to get the word out on this program and utilize it for the services and supports as much as we can. So there is a link here as well to apply. It is an online application process, just like our residual, charitable residual program. Um, the supporting documentation is basically the same, except this program does not require the completion of a joint or agreement. Um, but you will have to apply, you know, put in a, an invoice for what is being requested, um, a letter of support, and then it goes through the application process. It goes to our Cecil and David Rosenthal team, and then we make determinations. Uh, again, this isn't as big as the residual program. So as these come in, they're sent to our team and then they're processed and move forward. Uh, where residual, we have a high volume of those applications. So it does take a little bit more time to process and get those out. Uh, if anyone wants to look at more information for this program, you would simply go to the achieva.info slash Rosenthal fund, and it will take you directly to this page. This also has a screening tool. Um, so whenever you click it, you will go through the process. And then if you answer yes or no to, to several of the questions, it will determine which program is better suitable for the applicant at this time to move forward with. Okay, any questions with that? Anything in the chat or anything, nothing? Okay. There's nothing in the chat right now. Does anybody have any questions as we finish up? I do have a couple of questions. First okay. of all, thank you. Just great, helpful information. Um, so given the profile of my clients, um, it's looking like Achieva Family Trust would be the one that my clients would be referred to as opposed to the Rosenthal one, correct? Correct. Okay. And how, what would my latitude or um, how much would I be able to promote this 
um, or would it be case by case if I have a potential client and they say they can't afford it, I would give them your information or is it something I could put on my, um, in my newsletter that I send out quarterly through email or, um, I would say case by case for now, um, okay. you know, typically whenever we go through like newsletters and, and having links on website, that would have to go through another process to get the permission to be able to, you know, put that information out there. So for now, I would just say, you know, case by case, you can share my information and they can call me directly. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? So let, this is Catherine. So let me just add, Jen and I do work together very closely. We do a lot of presentations together. Um, and a lot of times people will ask me questions. And while I know the program pretty well, I don't know it as well as Jen. So I always, always refer them to her directly because she is the person who knows the program inside and out. And so I would just encourage you if people have questions, Jen, if you could put your information in the chat so people know mm -hmm. how to reach you by email and phone, um, it would really be best if that you direct the person who has the question directly to Jen. I just agree. Trying, trying to um, answer questions, um, trying to answer questions about somebody else's program, even when you know it as well as I do, it is almost always disastrous. <laughs> So, you know, uh, just referring them to Jen is really the best, the best option. And then she'll have their contact information and, and they will have hers and they can, they can go back and forth if they need to. Yes, that's a good idea, Catherine. Um, we do have a lot of, well, this person said this, I called this person. Yeah. And whenever it comes to me, sometimes those lines of communication are not great. And then they come to me and then they're, you know, some people are a little upset and angry because someone told them one thing and whenever it's the other. So just okay. cut out the middleman, come right to me, email me, call me. Um, you know, we can set up a time to talk. I can get back to you as soon as I possibly can. Um, the more information too that you can provide me, the better that I can explain the situation and explain the process and go through and give you the most accurate information to to process the request. Great. And then I just wanted to put a, um, a plug in before we wrap up. Alyssa, if you're on the call, could you turn your camera on so I can introduce you? Yes, sorry, one second. Okay, no, no worries. So at, as we stated at the beginning of the, of the call, um, I work for the Archibald County. I also work for the Achievement Family Trust. Both of those organizations are underneath the purview of a big nonprofit in Pittsburgh called Achieva. And I just wanted to introduce everyone to Alyssa. She is our disability and family advocate. So if you have a student, a son or a daughter, or you're a teacher and you have a student in your room that has an IEP or needs an IEP or a 504 or needs any type of advocacy for anything, uh, we could be your first call. Uh, we don't charge anything for our services and we're happy to um, help navigate the world of IEP and 504. Um, we come to the table in an extremely collaborative way. Uh, we want to help you solve the issue so that your son or daughter uh, gets the, the, the education that they're entitled to. So Alyssa, if you could just give them your contact information and tell them how to make a referral or how to make a, make a call if they need to, that would be fantastic. Yeah, and I can put my information in the chat so everybody can write it down. Oh, um, that would be great. Fantastic. Okay. So basically, we have our um, our centralized intake line, and people usually call in on that line, and just give a quick, you know, example of what's going on, and then give it their contact information, and then we, you know, we'll call you back. There's myself and four other advocates, and we will call you back um, as soon as we are able to. Right now, we do have a small waiting list, so typically we'll call you or send you a text same day just to let you know if there is a waiting list, um, and then somebody will be getting back to you shortly, um, but typically it only takes a few days or a week or so. 
Um, so I'll put my information in the chat so everybody has it. One second. Thanks, thank you so much, Alyssa. And I know that Tish and Tracy are both very familiar with our organization. They both referred folks to us. Um, we've we've helped both of those organizations in the past. And again, feel free. You know, this is a really challenging time coming out of COVID. Uh, after three years, a lot of kids are struggling. A lot of kids are behind, um, and a lot of adults actually are struggling as well. So we don't just we don't just do advocacy for kids. We we um, provide services to men, women, and children from birth to death. So we do all kinds of advocacy around waiver and insurance and you name it, and we can help you. And if we don't have a resource for you, we will connect you. Uh, we will connect you to a resource. So uh, Liz is just adding her information in. I will add my information into the chat as well. Um, are there any questions before we wrap up? Okay. Well, um, let me again just thank uh, Tracy Palazzato and Tish Bartlett. Uh, we have been planning this training for quite some time. We um, are hoping to do something after the new year in February or March. So if you all have ideas of topics that you would like to learn more about or know more about, please reach out to us. We're happy to try and collaborate and put something together for all of us uh, to be able to continue to uh, navigate this world that is so incredibly challenged to navigate for our for our family members. So thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Um, Jen, Tracy, Tish, thanks so much. I hope everybody has a great night.